Hi, I'm Maggie. Welcome to Experiments in Crafting. Uh, tonight I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. I don't have much of an agenda. Um, I'm just going to be working on a crochet project and taking questions and answers, or taking questions and trying to answer them. Um, so anything that you have crochet related questions, yarn related questions, um, things about tools that you use in uh, fiber arts, uh, whatever you can think of. If you have suggestions on videos that you would really like to see, something that you'd like me to do in the future, um, I would love to have those as well. I kind of just want to have an open discussion about what we're doing or, you know, what's going on with the channel and, you know, if you have any questions in your, uh, in your life, I guess. Um, so, yeah, um, what I'm going to be working with tonight is Lion Brand's Re-Up. I also have a uh, blanket project to work on on the side here. It's a really simple stitch pattern that I've been working on. Um, just something really easy that I can work on while I talk. Um, but recently I got Lion Brand's Re-Up and it is an 85-15 uh, cotton polyester blend. So 85% cotton, 15% polyester. It's made of recycled cotton. Um, I have not been able to find out from Lion Brand whether the 85% the cotton is 100% recycled. So it's either, so it could be that when they made it, they used 50% recycled cotton, 50% new cotton, and then blended that 85-15. Um, Nowhere does it say it's 100% recycled cotton plus 15% polyester. So um, I'm just not sure. As, as a career, I work with recycled content yarns um, for the textile industry. And it, it would be different than my experience if it was 100% of the 85% of the cotton was all recycled. So it would be interesting to know. I've tweeted at Lion Brand in the past to see what they have to say, and I didn't get an answer. But the end result is this is a pretty interesting yarn overall. Um, it's not the softest cotton I've ever felt, but it is soft enough. Um, the colors that it comes in are, well, I'll go to those in a second. Um, the colors that it comes in are varying shades of vibrant. So the red is relatively vibrant. The black is pretty deep. Um, the rest are what I would consider dishcloth quality colors. Like they, they're, they're just a little bit blah. Um, so it's fine for dishcloths. I wouldn't necessarily want to make something wearable out of it. Um, it's also a little bit splitty. I made a couple of dishcloths, and maybe you've seen this on um, Instagram or on Facebook. I posted some pictures of these uh, colors back here, this kind of aqua color, uh, an off-white, and a gray. And I thought these were really pretty for dishcloths, and I made them for a bridal shower that I went to this weekend and posted some pictures. And so one of the things I was going to do tonight is just work on a dishcloth uh, for a full yarn review of this yarn. So, um, so somebody mentioned that they like the colors. I think I like them too. It's just like I said, they're not, they're not vibrant like acrylic is vibrant. Um, they, cotton just never is. And that's the trade-off for working with cotton is that it's never white is vibrant. But you wouldn't want an acrylic dishcloth necessarily. It's not going to work exactly the same way. You kind of want to use cotton for for the absorbent nature that cotton has. So um, what pattern did I use? So the pattern that I used, I used three different stitches. Um, I just basically made squares out of them. I used a woven stitch which is a single crochet, chain one, single crochet, 
and then on the next row you single crochet into all your chain spaces and chain over all your single crochets and you work that back and forth um, and it gives a really pretty woven look and I just put a scalloped edge on that. Um, I also did just a square of half double crochet which just gave kind of a nice um, solid dishcloth and then the other one I did was an interlocking shell stitch. So what you do with that is you double crochet five into the same, uh, in all into one stitch, and then you skip two, single crochet, skip two, double crochet five, all the way down the row. And then on your way back, you make shells that are sort of inverted um, by doing a double crochet five together. Um, and it gives a really nice solid fabric. It's actually the stitch that I'm working on this blanket and I will be having a tutorial coming out soon. Um, I'm just trying to get this blanket done. And so you can see here, um, it's a little bit trickier to see what's going on, but there's shells along here. And then in the next row you have inverted shells um, to make a really nice solid fabric. I'm really, really liking the way that this is turning out. It gives a really nice solid blanket. I think it, a lot of times people want to knit blankets for baby blankets because they turn out a little bit more solid and a lot of times, it really depends. Some people really like open lacy baby blankets and I think they're absolutely gorgeous and some people really don't want open blankets for babies. They just, for one reason or another, they think um, you don't want holes for baby's fingers to get caught in, and it really depends on how you feel about it. But a lot of times it can be difficult to find baby blanket patterns that are very solid other than just straight single crochet or straight half double crochet uh, to in crochet. Um, knit blankets, super easy to find solid blankets. Knitting lends itself really well to making fabric that doesn't have holes. Uh, crochet, not so much. You pretty much always have some degree of holes. It's just how much you can close them up. Um, see a comment that you love this pattern. Um, I, like I said, I'm really, really liking the way that this is working up. Um, I just released a stitch tutorial on another solid baby blanket stitch. Um, it, it really is a stitch that's good for any number of different uh, applications. It would make a really nice warm scarf. It's called the Granny Spike Stitch, and you can look that up on my channel. It's up and live right now. Um, and this one, this interlocking shell stitch is coming soon. Um, again, I'm just trying to get this blanket done, so I'm about this far into the blanket. I probably have, I don't know, it's probably halfway done if I had to, if I had to guess. So I've just been working on this, and like I said, it'll be coming soon. So with that being said, I'm going to work a little bit on making up a, just a, a small washcloth, and I would love to have some questions um, maybe some suggestions, anything that you've got to say, I will try and keep an eye on the comments and just go from there. Um, I'm going to work with the re-up and choose a stitch out of one of my stitch dictionaries and go from there. Um, so one of the things when I'm looking to try and do tutorials for you guys is to go through and find some stitches um, that, that are searchable. And that's, it's a little bit tricky because they have to have some sort of name that people know them by. Um, so, at, and really that's because my channel right now is at a point where it relies on, on search and it relies on um, related searches. So if you watch a video and then it's, it, the video gets suggested um, so that I get views and the videos are found, um, it turns out that if I do a stitch that doesn't have a name or if it, it's a name that I come up with on my own because I didn't know what it was called, um, those videos just don't get searches and they don't get views, which 
makes them those videos get lost in the in the all of YouTube. So I usually go to a stitch dictionary and try and find something that's readily available, but there aren't great videos for. Um, so if you have a suggestion on a stitch that you've heard of and you'd like to see a uh, tutorial, um, most of our tutorials have been posted in 4K, and so hopefully that helps people out so that you can see really good detail um, and, and be able to work these stitches up. So if you have one that you're struggling with, I'd love to hear about that and see if I can get a video together on that. Um, but I'm just going to kind of flip through here and see if there's something. Um, I'll flip this around and kind of just page through this. See if there's something that looks like it would make a decent, uh, a decent washcloth. Um... The yarn that I'm using for the blanket somebody's asking about. So I'm going to set this aside for a second and I'll pull this back out. Uh, so this blanket here that I'm working on is with Premier DK Colors. Um, DK Colors is a color changing yarn. It is one of the nicer ones that I've worked with because it has relatively soft color changes, meaning it's not just one stitch is blue and then the next stitch is gray. There's a little bit of transition. Um, and I've found right now I would be hard pressed to find an actual hard color change here. Um, it's not a true gradient, but it is a pretty good. So I think here, um, somewhere in here, it changes from light to dark and it's pretty difficult to figure out where that is. Part of that is the pattern helping that out. Um, this, this pattern sort of blends the rows for you, but they do a really nice job with this yarn in, in making the colors flow really nicely. And it really works into a nice striped blanket. So yeah, again, Premier DK Colors is what I'm using for this blanket. Um, I picked this up at Joanne Fabric. I'm sure you can get it from Premier's website. Last time I was at my Joanne Fabric, they were clearancing this line out. I don't think it's being discontinued. It's just that the Joanne Fabric that I go to is relatively small and they don't seem to keep lines around very long because they only have a, like one aisle of yarn. And so if they want to put something new, they have to get rid of something old. So DK Colors was being clearanced out. That may be the case at your Joanne Fabric 2, um, or it might be readily available where you live. Um, so far I am, let's see, as far as skeins on this blanket, um, I think I just have one in here and then I'm on my second one. So yeah, I have one join right here, which means I got from here to here with one skein. Um, I've worked up, I don't know, about a third of this one. I would say that this is probably going to take between three and four skeins total, um, depending on if I put a border on it or not. So probably three for the body of the blanket and maybe, or maybe three and a half for the body of the blanket and half for a border. Um, you probably could get away with a small blanket, um, with just three skeins. I want to say it was about $6 a ball. Um, and they're pretty generous amounts. I think it's a 140 gram uh, ball, 383 yards. So, and it's a DK weight, which is a number three weight yarn. They recommend a four millimeter hook. And that is what I have been using for this blanket. So four millimeter G hook for this blanket. Um, Somebody said they're a first time viewer. That's great, welcome. Uh, I'm glad that you found us. Um, and of course, welcome to anybody who's returning. Um, I'm just trying to keep up with comments here. I think I am up to date on comments. So again, for those of you just joining us, this is going to be a little bit different than some of my other live streams. I'm just kind of working on projects and taking whatever questions you may have about crochet, about things that I'm working on. 
Um, if you have ideas or suggestions for videos that you'd like to see or stitches that you would like tutorials on, um, all of those would be great to see in the comment section. And I'll do my, my best to answer questions or, you know, write down my suggestions. So I'm going to go back to my book here and see if I can find a decent stitch to work up. Um, and I'm just going to work on a washcloth. So again, um, really I'm just looking for something searchable. So... Um, Really, I'm, I'm considering working on the woven stitch again. I, I struggled a little bit with it on the first washcloth I made. The end stitch gets a little bit, uh, little bit lost. And so um, I want to, I might work on this one again. It's a pretty easy pattern to work up. But because it ends in a chain and you've got to work into that chain, it's a little bit different so yeah I might just work on a woven stitch so I'm gonna set this aside and pick up my hook and choose a ball of yarn um, I think I'll just go purple um, Dawn is asking if I've done a sweater I have not I haven't made much in the way of actual like fitted clothing I do have all of the yarn purchased to make a tunic length sweater for my sister. Um, I've got a bunch of purple yarn and I can't think of what the name of that sweater was. It was in interweave crochet, I want to say about a year ago, and I bought all the yarn to do it. And the first instruction in the sweater is to single crochet like 293 or something insane and it was right around Christmas and I just put it aside and have not picked it back up. Uh, I certainly have not designed anything like a sweater or anything like that. Um, because of the way that uh, copyrights and stuff like that work, in order to make a video on something I have to sort of design it myself which is a lot of the time, or a lot of the reason that I do stitch tutorials because those are commonly available things that everyone knows. Um, but I'm just teaching how to do something like that. But if I want to, if I want to share a pattern, I have to make it myself, really. And I'm not much of a pattern designer yet. I've done some design on some baby blankets and some simple things like that, um, some cowls and stuff like that, but not much like clothing, which takes a lot more time and uh, really you need people to work it up and make sure that it works the way you say it's going to work. Um, so yeah, just going to work on this a little bit. The slip knot is not slipping. There it goes. Just checking my dictionary real quick on a uh, how many to chain here. Um, an even number of stitches. Okay. So yeah, this re-up yarn has been pretty nice to work with. Um, like I said, it's a little bit splitty, meaning that as you crochet it, you unwind it a little bit as you wrap, and then these plies split apart, and it's really easy to stick your hook between plies. Um, and that that's a problem with certain yarns. Other yarns doesn't seem to be an issue. Um, I've read a lot recently about how crochet is worse because of the way... Uh, we twist our yarn as we wrap. And so Z-twist yarn, which is becoming a little bit easier to find, sort of solves that problem. I really liked the way the Lion Brand ZZ Twist looked, but I also thought that I fought it a little bit, probably because we all, as crocheters, compensate 
for yarn untwisting by twisting it slightly different. So, I don't know. It's just preference, but certain yarns twist or untwist more readily. And so you get this splitting problem um, with certain lines. They just, the plies are not well, uh, what do I want to say? They, they don't hold on to each other very well. So the, the other like worst splitty yarn that I can think of is, uh, Karen Simply Soft. Simply Soft is sort of no notorious in the crochet community for splitting. Um, it's a nice yarn. It works up. It's very soft, but it splits terribly when you work with it. Sorry, I'm counting. I needed an even amount, so I needed to I needed to stop and count there for a second. Um, but again, like I said, if you have any questions or uh, comments about the channel or ideas for videos that you'd really like to see, um, I know the last stream that I did, there were a lot of suggestions and I've, I've got those available and I'm working on some of them so that I can get some more videos out for you guys. Um, I did mention a little bit ago that I, um, well, I think a few streams ago I, I mentioned that I had uh, started a new job and it's doing research and development in the textile industry and um, it takes up a lot of my schedule a lot more than I had anticipated when I took the job um, and I'm really really enjoying it but it does make it a bit difficult to get videos out so I want to thank you all for bearing with me um, kind of sporadic video release but um, it does seem like most of you tend to enjoy the videos as they come out and uh, I'm glad for that so Again, with this woven stitch, like I said earlier, it's a single crochet, chain one, and then you skip and single crochet. And then in the next row, I'm going to single crochet into all of my gaps and chain over all of my single crochets. And so it just works up to be a relatively dense fabric um, with a very different look than just 100% single crochet. Those chains really make a huge difference. So, um, yeah, I haven't done a whole bunch of, for a while I was doing a bunch of unboxing videos and I haven't done a bunch recently. I, I actually haven't done a whole lot of yarn shopping recently, which is relatively weird for me. Um, but I have a whole lot of indie dyed yarns, um, mostly in in sock weight or number two, number one, depending on the yarn, um, weight categories. And if that would be something of interest, I would, I would be willing to sort of make some videos and share different brands with you. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you attend like fiber festivals or, uh, I guess fiber festivals is really like yarn shows basically and just walk around and see all of the different hand dyed yarns and what's out there. Um, or how many of you shop for yarn online without touching it versus shopping at like Joanne fabric or Michael's or whatnot. So if there's interest in seeing some of the fancier hand dyed yarns, um, I'd love to share those with you too. And 
then either I miscounted or something went wrong here, but I am off a stitch, so I'm going to pull this back out and pull a chain out. Because I think I probably miscounted while I was trying to talk. Um... So, if you haven't been to a fiber event, there is, there's quite a few of them around. Summer tends to be, well, late spring to early fall is when a lot of the state shows are. So, I know Northern Illinois Sheep and Wool was just last weekend. Um, Southern Illinois Sheep and Wool was in April. Um, Wisconsin sheep and wool tends to be in early fall. I don't remember exactly when, but I want to say around September, October. Um, but depending on where you're at, assuming that you're in the U.S., I guess I shouldn't assume. Um, there are shows pretty much most of the spring, all summer, and into early fall that, that you can go and see... Uh, all sorts of different fiber related activities and then usually vendors are there to sell um, they sell raw fleece if you want to spin yarn um, but then they also sell uh, uh, okay so you're in Texas um, I think Texas has some pretty big festivals. There was one in Dallas-Fort Worth a few months back that was a pretty big festival. Um, a lot of the big indie dyers were at that. Um, there is a website that has sort of a master list of all of the big fiber events going on um, worldwide. And I... I can never think of what that link is. Um, Knitters Pride. And... I'd have to pull my phone out and look on Instagram. I have it in a, in a direct message. Um, I think I also recently posted it on Facebook to a private group. So I'd have to look and see. But if you search for fiber events or fiber calendar, a lot of times you can find... Um, just a, a, a master list of, of what's going on. There is also a big event that's held, I don't know, I want to say like three or four places every year called Stitches. Um, it's almost always in, Stitches Midwest is in Schaumburg, Illinois every year, and I usually go to that. Um, Stitches United, I think, moves around. Um, and that was, I think, just last weekend. Um, and then I thought that there was a Stitches South that tends to be in Texas, but I could be wrong about that entirely. Um, so yeah, they're, they're a lot of fun. The fiber community is, um, just kind of a lot of fun to be around. It's fun to go and just be around people who love yarn as much as you do and, and it's not crazy if you're buying, you know, a ridiculous amount of yarn or you already have too much yarn at home, but nobody really cares. You just want more. Um, it's also fun to go see all the new tools. A lot of times Clover is at the big events and you can see a lot of their new stuff. Uh, I pretty much exclusively use Clover hooks. I... I keep buying other hooks. I want to try other hooks. Thing, I'll find ones that are pretty or something. And I always go back to my clover hooks. So um, they're not the most ergonomic. Like they, they have this squishy cover over them. But it, it, it's really the metal right here that I am absolutely in love with. It it's super slippery. It's almost like it's got some sort of coating or like, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to wear off. I've been using these for years at this point and they don't seem to lose this coating at all. So I don't know if they're powder coated or if they're magic or what, but they're, they're pretty amazing hooks. 
Um, so, like I said, I've tried a thousand different hooks. I've got a whole bin of them behind me. And I always come back to this set of hooks. I own them in every size they make them. But Clover also makes all sorts of crazy, cool toys, I guess, for fiber artists and for sewers. Um, so I, I like to go look at their booth. And it's kind of fun to see what's coming out, what's not available in stores yet. They make all sorts of neat stuff. <laughs> um, Hobby Lobby for clearance yarn. I have not been to Hobby... I, I've been to Hobby Lobby in the past for clearance yarn. I have plenty of Hobby Lobby um, stuff that I've bought on clearance. But what I was a little bit disappointed... So Hobby... I had been waiting for these uh, ergonomic hooks. I might have one in the drawer here. These guys. These acrylic ergonomic hooks at, with like kind of the bubbly handles that sort of mimic the furls hooks. Furls make super, super expensive high-end crochet hooks that are supposed to be really like good for your hands and so you don't get like arthritis flare-ups and stuff like that. Um, they had these hooks. They were a few bucks a piece. I was sort of waiting for them to go on sale. So Hobby Lobby's sales change each week. And I was just waiting for Crochet Notions to go on sale. So like when all of the hooks and stuff like that. And I went back and I was looking for something else. And I walked down the crochet hook aisle and they had clearance them all out at my store, at every local store around me. And so I was pretty disappointed that I missed out. So I think I have two of these. Uh, I have an I hook and a K hook and nothing else. And um, they got rid of them online. They got rid of them in most of the stores around me. Um, and I haven't been able to find anyone selling them online or anything like that. I guess they're not well reviewed. Um, they're acrylic and they tend to break pretty readily. But they're really, really pretty. And I kind of just wanted a set. I was thinking about maybe doing something um, like some sort of shadow box or something and making a display out of them. Because like I said, they're super cute just to look at. So, yeah. Um, somebody mentioned that they break easy. And um, so, yeah, they're, they're pretty to look at, but not very functional. Um, so I guess it's probably a good thing that Hobby Lobby got rid of them because they probably don't compete whatsoever with the Furls ones, really. Um, but I kind of wish I had grabbed them while they were on clearance. Um, oh, wow, that's pretty bad, like, to lose three hooks. Um, that would be extremely frustrating, too, because they're... They're cheap, but they're not that cheap. I want to say they were between 4 and $6 or something, depending on the size of the hook. It's another thing that sort of confuses me about Hobby Lobby's hook pricing, um, they go up like $0.10 cents per size, and it's just a little bit annoying. I, I get that it takes a little bit more material to make each one, but it's just a little bit weird. I don't know that anybody else prices hooks... Um, so that they're like 10 cents more for each size up. Um, oh, so the, uh, they're, they're breaking when you drop them versus breaking when you use them. I guess that's maybe a little bit better, but it's still not good. Like, you should be able to drop your hooks. Um, my crochet stuff lives in, like, my backpack. I, I generally carry a backpack instead of a, a purse. Um, mostly because I carry way too much stuff with me. Uh, if I just would get used to carrying less stuff. But I usually have, I would say, at least two projects and a couple of pattern books and a notebook to make design notes um, with me. And so I don't think easily breakable hooks would fare well in my backpack full of everything I own. Um... Yeah, I've been I've been watching eBay. I've been watching 
Facebook Marketplace. I just haven't noticed anyone put them up. Um, I suspect in... So they're still sort of being clearanced out at some locations, and so I suspect at some point people will realize that they don't really care for them and get rid of them. They're just not... Re at least I haven't found that they're readily available. Um, one of the closed Facebook groups I'm on, uh, somebody had asked for them. They were they put an in search of um, up on on the site, and enough people came together, and the, the person who was looking got a complete set that she was looking for. And so I thought about after she got all of what she wanted, posting the same basically the same post over and seeing if anyone else um, would. You know, if anyone else had a set that they wanted to get rid of. But it's more of just, I want them, but I don't really know what I'm going to do with them. Because I probably won't actually use them to crochet. So I got to kind of decide how much I really want to spend on getting them and having them shipped. Um, yeah, so... The Clover Amour and the Susan Bates with the covered handle. I have one Susan Bates with a covered handle because I plan on doing a um, sort of a, a hook comparison, like a mega comparison. I've just been kind of accruing hooks from all different vendors. Um, I should probably have done it a little bit more planned out and bought all the same size and really uh, compared them you know, I can compare apples to apples, but I didn't. I just buy whatever my favorite hook size is at the time. Um, so my general favorite hook size is an E, which is a three and a half millimeter. And that's because I pretty much only work with uh, fingering weight, like sock yarns for myself. Um, I make a ton of 100 gram fingering weight shawls and then... I basically pretty much only use an e-hook, but since I've been doing this channel, I've been using a lot more variety in hooks because I've been reviewing a lot of yarns that are generally a bit heavier. Um, I seem to tend to use an i-hook, I think, the most, and so I've bought a lot recently of i-hooks and k-hooks, and so I've got a wide variety of a whole bunch of different hooks. Um... The Susan Bates works a little bit with the better with the cotton. I could believe that because the the Susan Bates have the I think those are called inline. Though I never remember. There's tapered and inline. I think those are inline hooks. Um and Yeah, I think those are inline hooks. And I learned on boy style hooks, which are tapered. And the Clover and Boars are supposed to be a hybrid, but really I think they're closer to tapered than they are to inline. And so it, it's a little bit tricky for me to get used to a Susan Bates hook, but I, I have and I can use them. I just prefer a tapered hook. Um, but I could see how those are better for cotton, um, just because cotton does tend to be a little bit more splitty because the the plies don't tend to grab onto each other as well. And so I could see how that, um, especially if they had a little bit different style head on them, which they tend to, they're usually a little bit wider and flatter. Um, you might not split your plies so often. Um, to Heidi's Hangout, who hasn't tried the Clover Hooks, I strongly recommend that you uh, give them a try. So one of the things that I don't think a ton of people know about, there's a website called camelcamelcamel.com. It's just, uh, it's a website where you can go on and you put in an Amazon link and they'll tell you what the price history of a particular item is. So you would go to Amazon, you'd look up Clover Hooks and the 10 pack of Clover Hooks, I think retails like $75 if you go into Joanne Fabric. Um, you can almost never get it with a coupon. I don't remember if it's excluded or what the problem is, but I, I was having trouble using a coupon on it. Um, you can use coupon on the regular hooks, but for whatever reason that's set, I don't know if it was just that I, I kept catching it, like 
they might always be just a little bit on sale so that you can't use a coupon. I don't remember what the problem was. But even with a 60% off coupon, which is the best coupon Joanne Fabric releases on a regular basis, um, that's still pretty pricey. The I have gotten, I think, two orders now of Clover Amour hooks, the, the whole 10 pack, which is a B hook through a K, through a J hook. Um, it's a 10 piece set. Um, I've gotten it twice now for $22, I think, 22 to $25, which is a fantastic deal. Um, but again, if you just go to, um, my husband's saying right now it's $32, which is a really good deal. It's 50% off of its list price. Um, but one of the cool things about Camel, Camel, Camel is that you can put a, uh, a price you're willing to pay into there and then tell it to notify you. Um, and they'll send you an email when that price hits. So I've put a standing request. If it drops below $25, I it get, I get an email from Camel, Camel, Camel. It says, uh, you know, the product you're interested drop below the price that you set. And then um, depending on how much below it dropped, I usually buy a set um, because I seem to lose. I'm pretty good with my hooks. I don't I don't usually lose them and then they're permanently lost. But what I tend to do is leave them with a project and then I'll put the project bag away and forget about the fact that I left a hook in there. And then it's lost for a couple of months because I forgot about I was working on this project and I put this particular hook in the bag and then I can't find it for the next project I'm looking for. Um... Sorry, just catching up on comments here. Um, so I started on the metal boy hooks and those are just fine. Um, and they're great to start out with. Actually, the thing that I really liked about the boy hooks, and if you'll give me one second, I might be able to find it. Uh, yeah. So I don't have, I have a box around here somewhere and Boy makes a like bubble shaped, um, it's a blue and green handle that you can put hooks in and it comes with collars. Um, it might be in the bottom drawer next to you. Um, it's in a blue case or a clear case. Anyway, they make this, this handle that you can put the, the regular boy hooks in and put a collar on top of them. And then you have like this really nice, big ergonomic grip. And I crocheted with that for, I don't know, probably a year and a half before I switched to, um, switched to the Clover Amour hooks. Clover also makes a flat style hook called something. I, it's escaping me. Um, the metal on the ends of the hooks is exactly the same, but instead of being a round uh, round end down here, a round handle, the handles are the handles are flat like more like a butter knife, like like the, the kind of handle that would be on your knife at home. Um, soft touch. Thank you. Somebody put it in the comments. I knew somebody would know. Um, I, so the soft touch are supposed to be better for people who knife grip, which I do. Um, so some people hold their, their hooks more like a pencil. Some hold them more like a knife. Um, the soft touch are supposed to be more for people who knife hold. These ones are more shaped like a pencil. And so that's what they're sort of targeted for. Um, I use the Amores like a, uh, like a knife. So I, I might be in the minority here, but the, these are the hooks that I basically can't live without. So, um, but if you want to just try one out, Joanne Fabric almost always has some sort of coupon and 
or hooks are just on sale and they usually have all of the Amour hooks available individually. So whatever hook you you use most, um, then you can just grab one. Um, you need to try the soft touch to compare. Yeah, I, I have a couple of soft touch hooks around. Um, I think I've got one right here. Yeah, I do have one right here. So this is the Clover Soft Touch. Um, they come, they're all this kind of gold color with gold metal, but it feels exactly the same. Um, so let me move some stuff out of the way. This is an eye hook. They have this like thumb spot to hold. And then this flat part is supposed to sit a little bit better for a knife hook where you would not really want to use this at all because I don't know if you can tell but this part is really flat compared to this being really round um, might be a little bit difficult to see on screen there but this one is really shaped like a kid's pencil with like a, a grip on it um, so if you think of like a a kid learning to write, they sometimes put those grippy things around a pencil um, so their thumb or their uh, index finger knows where to sit. Um, this is really flat like the blade of a knife so that you can hold it like this. Uh, but again, I, I've i tried these. I just don't, don't really love them. Um, I don't dislike them. And again, the, the thing that I really look for is that this metal is super slippery compared to anything else I've used. So, um, yeah, just kind of looking through the comments. And for those of you just joining us, I don't know who's been here the whole time and who hasn't, but this is kind of just an informal, I don't have much of an agenda type of stream tonight. Uh, I'm just, I was working on a dishcloth and I'm just taking whatever uh, questions and answer or whatever questions you might have or suggestions for future videos uh, anything that you guys want to talk about I just thought it might be kind of fun to do a sort of casual live stream rather than something that has a, a set agenda so um, I've got my laptop open and I can see comments coming in so if you have questions or anything like that anything I can answer um, it would be great to see those. Uh, metal section is shorter. Yeah, probably I didn't, I didn't hold them next to each other. It might be because the hook sizes are slightly different too. Um, I don't know if it, if it varies by size of the hook. Um, but yeah, it could just be that they're shorter. The only thing that I've found that the clover hooks don't work for there is a crochet, a crochet designer whose name is uh, Ava Nee. She's out of Ireland, so her name is not spelled like A-V-A or, or, or you know, um, how we would typically spell it. But she does, uh, she designs Tunisian patterns that are done in short rows so you don't have to do them on Tunisian hooks they're intended to do just on on a shorter hook but I have found that the clover hooks are just a little bit too short with their available amount of metal um, you can't quite get one of the longer short rows on the hook um, what I've done for that to make it work is you can sometimes like slide these down a little bit. Um, so like if you squeeze and pull, the problem with that is that not very far in here, um, there's like a flat part that sits in this flat part. And so you probably don't want to do this with everything because there's now a spot where your stitches can fall off. But I have made it work um, just so I don't have to switch hook type. Um, but a regular boy hook would definitely be better for her, her particular type of crochet. 
I don't know of any other designers that use short rows like that. Um, just, just that particular designer. And I can... Um... Oh, so I guess uh, entrelock stitches must also work very similarly where you work them. Um, yeah, for, for not too long. For lesser amount of stitches. Yeah. So probably very similar to this style of crochet um, where you just put a bunch of stitches all on on your hook at the same time um, you with the ergonomic style you do run out of space okay so it uses Tunisian hooks um, I I don't know how many of you do Tunisian crochet. I've only done a little bit of it and not really because I dislike it just because I haven't had much call for doing it. Um, but I don't know it. I have a handful of Tunisian hooks. Uh, mine are all knit picks. They're all, all the knit picks Tunisian hooks that I have are all Susan Bates style inline hooks. And so, again, they took me a little bit of time to get used to, but they're kind of nice because they have the, they use the same cables that knitting needles, so circular knitting needles use, and you don't have the super long hook style um, that get a little bit unwieldy to, to manage. Um, so, yeah. Uh, somebody asked earlier up what my favorite type of cotton is, and I don't know, I don't know if I have a good answer for that because I don't, I don't really like working with cotton all that much, if I'm being totally honest. Um, I find that cotton can be a little bit difficult to switch back and forth of like if I if I'm working with cotton and I'm only working with cotton um I get used to the tension but if I switch back and forth between wool and a cotton or acrylic and cotton I tend to have trouble getting my tension right because cotton has no give really um that being said I tend to pick cotton blends um so I did a whole poncho in Knit Picks Cot Lin, which was a cotton linen blend, and that worked up really well. Um, I've worked with, what was it called? Um, Nettle Grove, which had nettle fiber and silk and cotton. It was a pretty weird yarn, um, but that also worked up really nice. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know that I've found a favorite cotton yet. Um, I was actually surprised. I did a review on shawl in a cake. I made a, a shawl out of that, and that's a surprising percentage of cotton. I want to say it's it's more than 50% cotton, um, which sort of surprised me because it, it works up really, really nicely. Um, and I didn't have any tension issues with that, but... I guess I'm sort of just getting into making dishcloths. Uh, I'm being told it's 58% cotton. So, um, like I said, surprising amount of cotton. I sort of just expected it to be 100%. Two cottons from Hobby Lobby that I shared on the last stream. Um, one... Oh, we might have dropped out, but hopefully we're back. Um... So what I was saying is that uh, as far as the cottons from Hobby Lobby, I have not tried Sugar Wheel. Um, I just bought one that is a color changing yarn and then I bought Cotton XXL, which seems like it's going to be really cool. It's a big fluffy cotton. Um, I'm thinking about making like a hand towel out of it with uh, like three different colors and I think it's going to look really neat. Um, I... I can definitely look into Sugar Wheel and see um, how it is and maybe get a review together on that. Um, but like I was saying before, I, I, I 
just sort of started getting into dishcloths and stuff like that. They're really good projects for showing off stitches. Um, so if I want to do a tutorial, it's really nice and easy to make a cotton dishcloth and then they make nice little presents for people. Um, so it, it works out in, in my favor, I guess, uh, because it's just a nice, simple, small project to work up. Um... Shawl and a Cake. So I have a full review of Shawl and a Cake on the channel. Um, it's it's an interesting yarn. It's really fluffy and fuzzy, and so it can be a little bit difficult to see your stitches. Um, but it it really turned out to be a very nice project. Um, I it's in the the bin under the table over there with all of the finished projects. Um, it. It's a really vibrant, pretty yarn, um, especially the color that I'd picked out. Um, and it came in a whole lot of really pretty colors. Shawl in a Ball is exactly the same yarn as Shawl in a Cake, except that Shawl in a Ball was notorious for just falling completely apart. Not, not the yarn, but the entire ball. Uh, no, it's pink and blue and white and triangle shaped. Um, my husband's trying to get the shawl out so I can show you guys uh, what I worked up with that. So, um, but yeah, shawl and a cake is literally exactly the same yarn that they just rolled into a ball um, because the shawl and a ball, the not the yarn fell apart, but the, the entire ball fell apart and became a big tangled mess. So this is what I made out of shawl and a cake. Um, it's this big, bright, let me get this yarn out of the way here. Um, big, bright, pretty shawl. A ton of halo, but I really think it worked up really nice. Uh, and again, there's a full review of this yarn on the channel. Um, I do not remember what colorway this was. I can look it up, but, um, it should also be linked on, on the video. Uh, this pattern though, I am positive. It's Moogly Blogs, uh, Fortune Shawlette. It is a pattern that I know by heart at this point. I've... Yeah, uh, so... I believe it is the colorway Half Moon. So, again, um, it the pattern is Moogly Blog's Fortune Shawlette. It's a really simple corner-to-corner -corner style stitch. You can sort of use my corner-to-corner -corner tutorial. Um, it's basically exactly the same as a corner-to-corner -corner blanket, except instead of doing three... Uh, double crochets, you do a chain instead of one of the double crochets. So it it just works up a lot more open. She has full tutorials and charts and written pattern on this whole thing. You can make it in a triangle or you can make it in a long rectangle shape. Um, and really, I think this, this worked out really nicely. I only used one ball on this whole thing. I don't think I was able to do all three rows of the... Uh, maybe I did. Now that I'm looking at the edging, I think I did do the entire edging. Um, I have a tendency to work this shawl up. I think I've made like eight or nine of these at this point of this exact pattern. They work up really quickly. Um, I have a tendency not to leave myself enough yarn to do the... It's th a three row edging. And I usually run out on row two, and it still looks fine. But um, just if you're planning on doing that, try and leave yourself a good portion of your yarn to do the whole edging. Um, the stitch does help the colors blend really well. But actually, this yarn is one of only a handful that I can think of that is really a true gradient that's commercially available at a big box store. And what I mean by that is that there are, it, it, so 
let's start with this color down here in the corner, for example. Um, it is blue, like true, true blue down here. And then there is a section that has blue and purple tone to it. And you can see that it's slightly blue, but also slightly purple. And then it fades to purple, um, fades to a light purple that fades out to pink. Um, there's, there's actual true sections in here that are actually fading slowly and no hard color change. So if you think about Karen Cakes, which is like the, the most famous of the caked yarns, um, they, they might have red and then orange and then green, and you're just working along and one stitch is red and the next stitch is green. Um, or the next stitch is whatever the next color is. There's no transition. It, you might as well have just tied two balls together. And that's fine in most cases. But if you really want a real gradient yarn, you generally have to go to Indie Dyed. And they're generally pretty expensive. Um, there are a couple of yarns that are available in big box stores that are um, these stranded cotton gradients. Those are more similar to a gradient when they're worked up, but but still not exactly a gradient. This is one of the only ones I can think of that is a regular yarn available in, I think I got this at Joanne Fabric, I've seen it other places, um, that you can just walk in and buy a real gradient yarn. Um, Red Heart, It's a Wrap. The original It's a Wrap is the same as Karen Cakes. It just has hard color changes. Um, you're just working along and there's a color change. At least in the ball that I bought, I've only worked with one ball. Um, it's a Wrap Rainbow and It's a Wrap Sprinkles are the stranded yarns that I was talking about um, where they, they work up a lot more like a gradient yarn um, than, the, than the other caked yarns. Um, somebody is mentioning the corner to corner. Um, yeah, it, a couple of different comments on that. Um, I have a tutorial right now up with a super chunky, I think it's brunette blanket, baby stripes, um, showing how to make a corner to corner. It's, it's a fun thing to do a couple of times. It's probably not my all time favorite stitch ever. Um, this though, with the, with the more open look to it is, is probably one of my favorite patterns out there. It works up so fast. It's really easy. Um, the thing that I really love about corner to corner is that you don't have to chain, uh, and keep working into chains. So I guess I should, I should clarify that. You don't have to chain a whole big long row. So a lot of times if you want to work up a baby blanket, you have to chain out exactly as many as you want it to be wide or as many as you want it to be tall and then work back and forth in long rows. Corner to corner, you start with one block and you build it out to the edges and then you come back in. And so um, it works up really fast for a while and then you're working on long rows for a little while and then you start to go back in and it works faster towards the end. And that's kind of, I don't know, a little bit rewarding because towards the end, a lot of times you just want to be done. And corner to corner is one of the only ones where you, where the end goes faster. So that's kind of nice about it. Um... Let's see, where am I at? Can't seem to master the no chains. Oh, so uh, the chainless chainless double crochet or the standing double crochet, as I usually call it, um, that is a technique that I use as well in most of, most of my videos, though you can easily just not use it. So she always uses that, but you can always just chain two or chain three, depending on which you prefer. Um, and not do the chainless double crochet. Um, it is a little bit tricky to get the hang of, but I really like the way that it, 
it works up um, and you don't get the little gap on the side. It gives really nice even edges. Um, but it it definitely is tricky to get a hold or to get the hang of. Um, I have a handful of videos where I do it. Uh, maybe I do it slightly different and those could be of use to you. Um, if you check the most recent video that I just posted, which is the Granny Spike uh, tutorial, um, I show how I do it. Maybe it would be a little bit helpful to check that out. Um, I don't have a tutorial on just that particular stitch, the, the chainless double crochet or the standing double crochet. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I definitely can get a tutorial together on that and, and maybe I do something slightly different or maybe my camera angle will be slightly different and it'll help you, uh, see that a little bit better. Um, it is a cool little technique. Um, sorry, just catching up with comments here. Um, as far as the holes in the corner to corner uh, blanket, like I was mentioning earlier, it is tough to find crochet blanket patterns that are not holy um, because of the way crochet works up. And then when you go to big yarns, it gets even harder because the holes get bigger because the yarn's bigger. Um, so a couple of the tutorials, well, the two my most recent tutorial, which is the crochet or the, uh, granny spike stitch. And then a couple of tutorials that are coming up soon. I have an interlocking shells tutorial. Um, and, oh, I'll be doing the woven stitch. Both have really, really low amounts of holes in them. And so those might be of more interest to you for baby blankets. Um, the problem with Stitches that don't have holes is they take a long time to work up because you, you're not making a whole lot of progress at a time. If you want to work fast, you use tall stitches and lots of holes and you get lacy products. Um, if you want to have something very dense and uh, with relatively low amounts of holes, then it's going to be slower. So it's sort of just a trade-off. Um... The Suzette stitch I'm not familiar with, but I will definitely look it up and see if I can um, see if that's a tutorial I can get together. Uh, it looks really cool. Um, for those of you who don't know, my husband does all of my pr like technical producing on all of my videos and runs all of my live streams. Um, and is who I'm usually talking to if I'm not talking to the camera. Um, so a lot of times if you're making comments or you're getting uh, links to stuff, if, if the Experiments and Crafting account is posting, he's usually doing it. Um, and so, yeah, he, if I'm talking to somebody who's not the camera, he's usually showing me something. And in this case, he was showing me the Suzette stitch and it looks really cool. Um, so we'll definitely... Uh, add that to the list of things to do a tutorial on. Um, so yeah, uh, I will definitely put the standing double crochet um, or chainless double crochet uh, on a list of things to get a tutorial together on. And, and like I said, maybe I will have a slightly different camera angle or just a slightly different style than Moogly. Um, actually, the reason that I didn't make a tutorial on my own was because I learned from Moogly. So, um, didn't seem, it didn't seem like a high priority originally because, uh, because that video exists. But if, if people are having trouble learning, maybe I do something slightly different and can explain it in a slightly different way. Yeah. Um, yeah, our, our basic stitch tutorial videos did not do fantastic, and so we we didn't do a whole lot more of those, but if it's something people are searching for, then they tend to do better. Um, the problem with, with, uh, with YouTube searches is that if you don't show up in the first, I don't know, eight or ten videos, most people stop looking. Um, and so if you search double crochet, 
the point it, it there's not really a whole lot of point in making a double crochet video unless you're a pretty big channel because you're not going to show up in the first eight or so searches and people will sort of give up so that's why we've sort of switched away from doing basic stitches and we do uh more searchable stitch tutorials right now um Oh, somebody's working on the Parfait Baby Blanket. Uh, I'm glad that it's turning out. I really, really liked working with the Parfait Layers yarn, um, except that they have a quality control issue um, with, with getting the colors right, and I struggled with that a little bit. Their, their customer service was very receptive to the feedback and, and talked with me for a while, and promise to address that. So I hope that they do because it's a really, really nice soft yarn and it's a really good value. Um, I think it was $10 and I got a whole baby blanket out of it and I'm sure I used a coupon. So it was probably really like $6 for a whole baby blanket. Um, it worked up super fast. So this is that blanket in case anyone's wondering. Um, and again, this tutorial is available on the channel. Um, it's a really soft, fluffy, fuzzy blanket that you just kind of want to keep squishing. This is a much more open pattern. It works up very fast because it's a it's an open pattern with a chunkier yarn. And so this really could be done in a day if you really devote some time to it. It could be done in a few days if you're just working on it part time. Um, and I'm really happy with the way the border turned out. It was something that I kind of just... Uh, design myself and I don't know it it's got a nice little bit of ruffle to it without being overly ruffly and I think it's perfectly uh, balanced for both boys and girls so depending it really doesn't matter who you're making the blanket for and it's a good blanket pattern if you are making it for a baby shower where you don't know the gender of the baby um, So, just kind of catching up here with, um, comments, just trying to catch up here. Yeah, so, um, uh, rectangle blocks, all single crochet. Oh, some more advanced stitches to try. Um, so yeah, I have a number of books here. I've been, like I was explaining earlier, I, I sort of have to stick with named stitches because they, ha they have to be somewhat searchable. Somebody's got to be looking for them so that, uh, that they get... YouTube has a thing that they call indexing, and it's whether they show up in search or not. And if they don't get a certain amount of views in a certain amount of time, they don't, they don't get picked up. Um, and so even if somebody searches for them later, they won't show up, and it's a whole kind of big rigmarole to make sure that the videos get seen. Um, and so I actually have really been enjoying these Japanese crochet books. Um, they have absolutely beautiful, intricate stitches in them. Um, hopefully you can kind of see some of these. However, they're not named in any fashion. So I, I've really wanted to show these and do some of these and just give them a random name. Like we call this one a leaf stitch because it kind of looks like leaves. Um, but it's... Uh, it's a little bit difficult because, again, until the channel's big enough that when I send out a video that enough people watch it just from from the email notification, um, it makes getting started on YouTube, I guess, the end of my statement here is getting started on YouTube is a little bit of a struggle to make sure that your videos get seen um, at some point. And I want to make sure that the time and effort that we put in that people actually get to see the content because 
so far it seems like people are enjoying it um, as long as they can find it. So um, to that end, I will start doing more stitch tutorials um, and trying to pick some more advanced ones. But really, I'd love to do some of these out of this Japanese uh, stitch books because they're really cool. And unless you read charts, they're pretty much inaccessible to, to most people. Um, it is one of the things that I'd like to try and do a video on, but it's going to be a little bit more elaborate and a little bit more difficult because teaching somebody to read charts without having feedback. Um, so I can do a video and then you'll probably have questions and then I might have to do a follow-up video and it's kind of hard to make a series out of it, um, though I might try anyway. Um, but I think being able to read charts opens up a lot of doors because then you can uh, you have a lot more patterns available. A lot of Russian patterns are available and a lot of Japanese patterns are available completely in charts and you don't need to read Russian or Japanese in order to use them. And so there's a lot of cool intricate patterns um, available on the internet, usually for free, um, that you could do if you could read charts. And so one of my goals is to try and get some chart reading videos out as well. So, um, just kind of skimming over here in the comments. Um, somebody mentioned that my husband's doing a great job and I agree. And I hope most of the rest of you do. <laughs> um, we kind of just do this as a hobby and so it's just kind of fun to use the video equipment and make these videos. Um, most of the time if I'm live streaming, it was his idea. Uh, and so you have him to thank for that if you're enjoying these live streams. Because he, he pushes me to do them and then, and then gets them all set up and gets everything ready and works through any technical issues that we're having and all that. So... Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good thought. Uh, maybe releasing a charts video with a future uh, live stream to do a question and answer just on that particular topic. Um, and I'd have to think about how to go about doing that, but that does sound like a great idea for format for that. Um, so I guess really if... If there's more questions, if you guys have any crochet-related questions or uh, topics that you'd like to see covered, um, definitely I will add more advanced crochet stitches to the list. Um, I'll scroll back through the comments. I'm sure there were a couple other suggestions in there. Um, but yeah, I, it, it helps me to know what people want to see because then... I know that I'm making something that you guys are interested in and not just something that I'm interested in talking about. So any ideas are always appreciated. Um, I don't know if, if you're really enjoying the, the yarn review videos, that's, that's great. And I can keep making those. If you want to see more tutorials, I can make those. Um, if you'd rather see some reviews on tools or hooks or any sorts of notions, um, Happy to make those. I sew a little bit, and so I may in the future make a couple of videos on sewing, but um, I'm certainly not a uh, fantastic seamstress. Um, I actually really learned to sew so that I could make project bags for crochet. So um, I've taken a few advanced classes through Joanne Fabric, and those were, those were fun, and I made... Uh, button-down dress shirt and a couple of little bags and stuff but mostly like I said I make project bags for myself um, and so maybe I'll do a tutorial on how I make my project bags so that you can make some um, yeah if you want to toss me one of those um, yeah so I've made project bags like these uh, where you seam the two different coordinating fabrics um, they have a lining. Zippers are not my friend. Um, this is the most common type of bag I make. I have 
Uh, literally, I probably have 50 of these with different projects in various states of being made. Um, but they're lined. I usually put a pocket in them. Yeah, this one has a pocket. So um, it's losing a lot of fluff. But so it's got a pocket. I usually put two little sections in here for crochet hooks and then two bigger pockets. Um, and then on the outside here, it's, I like drawstrings. So I made a couple with zippers. Zippers are really difficult to put in and they're not very yarn friendly. Um, the little teeth tend to catch the plies and rip them apart. And depending on how expensive and how delicate the yarn is, um, that can really ruin your day. Um, some yarns are fine. If you have something like Bernat Blanket that doesn't really have plies, um, that's fine. But also a ball of Bernat Blanket would not fit in this bag. So it's kind of a moot point at that, at that point. Um, but yeah, so I definitely could share how I did this. This is sort of a bunch of techniques probably learned from six or seven different patterns around the internet that I've sort of tailored into my favorite features about project bags. Um, I really like mine to be able to stand up on their own. I have a little loop over here that I can put a carabiner hook through and clip to a bag or whatever I'm doing. Again, like I said, I like pockets on the inside. I like this two-tone look um, just so that they're a little bit interesting. Um, you can also fold these down um, because they stand on their own and use them as a yarn bowl. Um, so this is something, I don't know, I put a lot of effort a while back into designing these exactly the way I wanted them. For a brief time, I considered selling them on Etsy. Project bags are surprisingly expensive on Etsy. Um, not that they're not worth it. I'm, uh, I occasionally buy a project bag from somebody because I want something unique. Um, a lot of times I buy ones that have special fabric. I actually bought this one here, um, which has Harry Potter fabric, but it's a special run of Harry Potter fabric that's kind of like crazy neon rainbowy colors. Um, and is a Japanese knot style bag, which I don't know how to make, but I could probably figure out at some point. Um, and so I bought and paid for this one. It's from Celestial Strings. She makes really pretty uh, bags. And usually you can get yarn to match them. So she'll do like a, a set where she does two skeins of yarn and a project bag. And it's about $60 shipped. And that's a pretty good deal for hand dyed yarn and a project bag all together. Um, so I'll buy those occasionally. I bought a limited edition... Uh, How to Train Your Dragon, when How to Train Your Dragon 3 came out. I bought this Harry Potter one. And I bought a really pretty one that's got like lotus blossoms on it. That's kind of like rainbow, um, magenta, very reminiscent of my hair um, in the basically the same color palette. So um, I don't know, a little bit about project bags. So if there's some interest there, I might put together a video on how I sew those together. Um, probably best done as like a two or three piece series. Um, when I was making a lot of them, I would do one day of ironing and cutting, one day of sewing pieces together, and then one day of final assembly. And so that might be a natural way to break those up um, just to, to sort of make those videos manageable because otherwise they're probably gonna be like an hour and a half long if I do a full tutorial. So. Um, add a divider to a handbag. I'm not sure I know exactly what you mean there, um, but I, like I said, I'm not a fantastic seamstress, but I might be able to figure something out if you could be a little bit more specific on what you mean about a, a divider. Um, I'm not sure if you mean like a, like an insert or or just adding a, a center pocket, um, like to the lining. Um, 
One of the other things is a, a coworker of mine is a really good seamstress and I'm really hoping to pick her brain this summer. Um, she's a temporary uh, employee for the summer um, and, and I'm hoping to pick her brain a little bit about sewing and, and improve my skills a little bit. So um, maybe expand my, my repertoire. Um, and Bridget mentioning that the yarn reviews are helpful. I'm really glad to hear that. I, I never know exactly what yarns to review. Um, I sort of just go to the store and buy what strikes me as pretty and then try and get reviews together on them. Um, I always feel like I should work something up with the yarns and not just give initial impressions. Though a lot of the times I feel like I can be a reasonably good judge if I just work up one chain and one row of single crochet and sort of know how it's going to go from there. Um, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. I always feel like I need some sort of project worked up to do a review and maybe that's not the case and I could get a lot more reviews done if I didn't spend the time working up full projects and just made something very small, like a little swatch. Um, so it's something I've been considering just making up a small four by four square and then reviewing the yarn. Um, but I, I like to make projects with things too and, and try my hand at a little bit of project design. So, um, Okay, so just talking about in a crochet purse, a liner with a middle divider and pockets. Um, I I haven't tried anything like that, but I'd be game to at least experiment a little bit. And if I can come up with something, I could do a video on that. Um, yeah, the re-up I kind of set aside. I was making a lot of mistakes. Apparently, I have a little bit more uh, difficulty talking and showing stuff than I uh, expected. So, um, like I said, I did work up some washcloths with reup. And if you follow me on either Facebook or Instagram, you can see a couple that I worked up. Uh, the off white one I worked up in this woven stitch. And so you might be able to see a little bit more detail on what I was doing previously. Um, but yeah, it is it's a little bit tricky to talk and and crochet at the same time. Um, but yeah, the, the re-up yarn, I'll probably do a full review on. It was just what I had available and thought it would be kind of fun to show you guys a little bit of a preview. Um, are you working on a specific pattern that just called for adding something or are you just trying to uh, go about designing that yourself. Um, cause if you, if you have a pattern and you want to share like a link, um, and you're just stuck on a particular part, I might be able to help you sort of off stream, see if I can offer some guidance. Um, I've, I've been considering potentially starting a, or like opening up a discord so that we can kind of do a little bit more offline, you know, talking and sort of make a commu community around this channel. Um, I just don't know if most of the people on the channel, uh, most of my viewers know what Discord is or use it regularly. Um, it's basically, it, it started as sort of a gaming, um, a way for gamers to find communities of people with similar interests and has expanded into um, just all sorts of communities with very specific subtopics. Um, so there's a lot of YouTubers and a lot of, uh, Twitch streamers have their own discord where their, uh, viewers can talk about videos or talk about, uh, specific topics. And so I've, I've considered doing that if, if there'd be some interest, um, Okay, so you're just trying to figure out how to do it. No pattern. Um, yeah, I will, I'll think about that and see if I can come up with a way. Because I guess the tricky part there is whether you would want to 
make the whole bag and then make a divider piece and stitch it in place or try and make it as one piece, which could maybe be done, but would be extremely tricky. So yeah, I could, I'll think about that a little bit and see if, see what I can come up with. Um, and I guess it depends on whether you're talking about adding a sewn lining to a crochet project or trying to crochet in the pockets. Um, cause those are two totally different tasks there. Um, some people do sew in linings into crochet handbags. Um, usually those have to be hands, they machine sew the lining and then hand stitch it to the project. Um, so you might be able to do something like that with a little bit more ease. If you're talking about actually adding a crocheted divider and crocheted pockets, um, those probably just have to be designed, probably the easiest way would be to design those and then sew them in, um, not to try and make it as one piece. So, okay, so it is adding a sewn lining. There should be a number of tutorials available on YouTube. I don't personally have one, um, but it could be something that I do down the road um, if I design a crochet handbag um, and then sew in a lining. That could be kind of a fun uh, joint tutorial with sewing and with crochet. So, yeah. Um, so... I guess, depending on if anyone else has any questions or anything like that, I, um, I'll look around and see if I can find a video on a sewn handbag, and, um, I think I can private message you somehow on YouTube. I'm not really sure about that. YouTube's a little bit weird. Um, if you happen to follow me on Facebook or Instagram and want to send me a message and I can message you back then. Um, but I'll look around and see what I can find um, as far as tutorials because they're, I, I know I've seen some in the past, but I might have to search around for a little while. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any additional questions, I will hang around for another minute or two and then I'll probably uh wrap up for the night and maybe we'll try this again another night this was kind of a fun format just taking questions and talking about crochet um like i said i didn't get much actual crocheting done but uh that happens i don't know if any of you attend like a weekly or monthly knitting or crochet night uh, at like a library or a local yarn store or anything like that. But I seem to seem to not actually get much crochet done when I'm there. I usually get a few rows or something done, but uh, mostly it's just talking about yarn and stuff. And so that this is kind of kind of fun because it's sort of like a weekly crochet meeting um, where you can just sort of chat about different topics, but uh, don't actually get a whole lot done. So, uh, with that being said, I think I covered everything that was asked. If I didn't, please, uh, message me. You can even either leave a comment on this video or you can, uh, send me a message on Facebook or Instagram and I will look at those and get back to you if I didn't answer your question tonight. Um, a suggestion on a beginner shawl pattern. So the shawl that I showed earlier, this, uh, this Moogly blog fortune shawlette, this is probably what I would recommend for a beginner pattern. It only uses chains and double crochets, uh, for the whole body of the shawl. It works up really fast and really open. Um, uh, I've made several of these with only hundred gram balls of, uh, fingering weight yarn. Um, this is Lion Brand Shawl on a Cake, like I mentioned earlier in, I don't remember, New Moon or Half Moon. Um, but yeah, I think if I was going to recommend a beginner shawl pattern, I would start with this one. It works up quickly and looks really nice. And I don't know, I've made like I said, I think I've made eight or nine of these and they all turn out really well. 
Um, it's a nice pattern. So you also do not have to work up the edging. You can just make a triangle shawl and that makes this quite a bit easier. So um, again, Moogly blog, it's called Fortune Shawlette. And I think she's got written pattern, video tutorials, charts, like anything you can ask for are all available for this particular pattern. Um, you can also make it in a triangle or a rectangle. So um, yeah, this is where I would start. If you want patterns on, or uh, suggestions on more advanced shawl patterns, um, shawls are like one of my favorite things to make. So uh, I'm happy to keep sharing those as, as you improve your skills and get a little bit more advanced with shawls. Um, I've got patterns for days on shawls. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm glad I pulled that back out. Yeah, that's definitely where I would recommend starting with beginner shawls. All right. Um, there's no more questions. I probably will uh, sign off and say have a good night. And again, if you have if I missed your comment, I think I got, got most of them, but if I missed your comment, please leave them in the comment section on this video and I will definitely get to them. Or if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, um, you can direct message me on either of those platforms um, and I will get back to you on those. Um, if you have suggestions on future videos you'd like to see, go ahead and leave those in the comment section as well. Um, if you like this format where we just did questions and answers and I showed you some stuff around my craft room, um, let me know that too. Um, you can either like the video or, uh, you know, let me know in the comment section below. Um, if you're a first time visitor, uh, please hit subscribe and turn on the notifications so that you get notifications about future uh, live streams and all of the videos that I post. And thank you for watching. Good night.